Um, as you know, West and North Africa have experienced an increasing uh, level of uh, political instability uh, over the last decade. It's uh, mostly due to uh, the rise of radical groups which try to um, establish Islamic law in the region, but also to a number of um, traffickers which uh, travel all around the region and also to uh, different secessionist movements which try to gain independence. So it's a very complex situation, it's very difficult to address by policy makers, but also a very interesting situation in terms of uh, uh, research because we have groups in which you find very often shifting loyalties, meaning uh, that people are used to move from one group to another depending on the uh, circumstances of situation. And we also have people that are very uh, good at traveling over very long distances. So the main objective of the paper, of the working paper, was to look at the social structure, but also the spatial patterns of those uh, radical groups. Just to give you an idea of how complicated or how dangerous the region has become, this is a set of map maps which shows the evolution from 2011 to 2013 of the areas defined by the French Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs as dangerous. The areas where you should not go on a, on a holiday. Uh, especially, uh, well this is West Africa, you can see that an, an increasing number of places are considered, as, uh, at least by the French, to be uh, generally uh, dangerous in this region. This is a, major concern not just for researchers but also for uh, policy makers and this is why the OECD has um, commissioned this, this new report in which almost half of the chapters are dealing with uh, the situation. So what we did was to look at the social and the spatial structure of radical groups and we wanted to know how those groups have been connected over the last 20 years. So we did a study on 21 countries in North and West Africa, but we also looked at the role of national borders on the spatial patterns of radical groups. And to do that, we had to focus on uh, a limited number of countries because of the number of uh, violent events that occur in, in the area. So we mostly focused on five countries, the Sahara and Sahel. Uh, we use open source data, data you can find online, you can just download it, start to work. Uh, the data set is called Armed Conflict Location and even data set ACLED, and it has more than 27,000 political events from 1997 to 2014. So if you have a special interest in one of those countries or many countries or an interest in, in one period of time, this is the good place to go to find uh, detailed information. We are interested in violent activities, so we select one of the violent uh, events, which, as you can see, involve more than a thousand of different groups. And when we look at the radical groups, we have about uh, 3,000 violent events. And this is what the data set looks like. You have the date, type, of, and, uh, and the name of the actors in conflict. You also know the location so that you can map the event. You have the source of the information. Most of the time it's the BBC or the French newspapers. A few notes about what happened. And finally, the number of victims. So you can really work with it. You can look at the historical evolution, but also the spatial evolution of violence. Uh, from a spatial perspective, this is what you get when you try to map um, political violence over the last 17 years. You have different clusters of violence. In terms of uh, victims, Nigeria is the main uh, center 
because it is affected by violence, as you know, not just in the north, but also in the center and in the south of the country. But that's where we find the highest number of victims. But northern Algeria has also a large uh, hotbed of, of violence, as well as uh, Libya, as you know. And this whole region along the Gulf of Guinea, between uh, Ivory Coast and, 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 and Gambia. This is quite um, usual. I mean, many people have tried to map those things. This is not the main originality of the paper, but it's important to try to locate before you analyze the connections between the groups. It's also important to look at the historical evolutions of, 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 um, of those events. And if you look at the period uh, between 1997 to today, you see that the number of victims has um, changed quite a lot. You have a first period during which most of the victims are related to the conflicts in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. You have a number of civil wars uh, from the 1980s to the uh, beginning of uh, 2000. And also in Algeria, where you have a very bloody uh, civil uh, conflict. This is what you see here. At the end of those conflicts, it's the beginning of uh, the civil war in Ivory Coast which means that the number of victims doesn't decrease very much as it is the case in other regions of the world. And more recently, since uh, the mid-2000s, uh, you have an increase in the number of victims related to radical groups. Those are the green lines you can see. And you can see that now most of the recent victims are related to those groups, which make the study of radical groups especially important today for us as researchers uh, for many uh, policy makers. Nigeria, Mali and Libya as we said are the major um, areas where political violence is, is present. So, once you know that, what can you do when you look at the connections between those actors? Because we have the name of the actual conflict, we can build a huge matrix in which we have all the actors in, in, in line and all uh, their enemies on the other side. And you can count the number of victims that are related to uh, the conflict between those actors. When you have a huge matrix like this, you can actually build a social network, which is a set of nodes. In this case, we have a number of radical groups and they are connected because they are in conflict which is with uh, each other. In this case I have represented only four actors but um, we have a lot of actors, we have uh, more than 1,000 actors. So it's a huge matrix but there are ways to present the data in a more uh, simple way as I will show you. So, if you try to map the social network related to political violence, this is what you get. You get a large set of actors in red, and the size of the nodes is proportional to its degree centrality, meaning the number of groups with whom the group is in conflict. So this node, for example, is AQAM, Al-Qaeda is the Islamic Maghreb. It is in conflict to its many other groups. So this is why it is very central on, uh, on the graph. You can see very well that the structure of this network is composed of different clusters. You have the Nigerian conflict on the top of this slide, which is very much about uh, Boko Haram and all his enemies. You have the Libyan cluster um, on, on the right, where you have a large number of militias and other groups which compete for power in Libya. And finally, the main cluster, which is here, is related to Algeria and all the groups who move from Algeria to Mali, Niger, Mauritania, 
because they were expelled by uh, the Algerian uh, military and uh, intelligence services. So when you map those connections, you find that violence clusters regionally in this, this part of Africa. But you can do a lot more. You can actually calculate the centrality of all the nodes and see what is the general structure and what is the centrality of a particular actor, for example. If we stay at the network level, we see that this is a network with a very low density, meaning that uh, violent groups tend to have less enemies than friends, which is quite normal. It's also the case for you and I. We try to have more <laughs> friends than enemies, right? This is what we, found, what we find in, uh, in, in West Africa. We also find a low level of transitivity, meaning that enemies of enemies will tend to be friends, which is quite normal, right? You can see that here. If you have three groups, uh, you have Al-Qaeda here, you have another Islamic movement on the right, and you have the Algerian military. If you find that Al-Qaeda and the military, and this group and the military are in conflict together, you suppose that Al-Qaeda and this movement will be friends. And this is exactly what we find. So this is interesting because we have a typical negative tie network. We don't have a network where people are connected because they exchange information or resources or because they are friends. We have a network which is connecting people fighting against, uh, against, against each other. Sorry. We also find that, unfortunately, civilians pay the highest price in this region, as in many regions in Africa. This is a table which shows uh, the bloodiest conflict between two different groups. And as you can see, civilians of Nigeria, but also Nigeria and, and Libya are the, along the main uh, victims. You can also see that Boko Haram, the Nigerian um, radical group, is by far the bloodiest actor in this entire region. Um, there are so many uh, measures of centrality which you can calculate when you have a social network. I'm just going to focus on a few of them. But this one is interesting. Um, we find that most radical groups have different types of enemies. So they are not in conflict just with governments or rebels or civilians. They tend to be in conflict with many types of actors at the same time. This is shown on the slide. Uh, the, the radical group is in green. And you can see that what we find is this kind of configuration where, uh, for example, the radical group is in conflict with two different governments. In this case, they belong to the same category of actors. But in many occasions as well, we find that radical groups are in conflict with governments, but also with rebels, with civilians, with uh, external forces as NATO, such as NATO or, or French military. Which means that the situation is very uh, complex in terms of uh, the deadliest conflicts are between radical groups and civilians, as I said before, or between radical groups and government. The number of victims is about the same. Now, if we look at the actor level, not the entire structure of the network, but if we look at the role of each node, we find that AQAM is the most central actor. This table shows two measures of centrality. Degree centrality, which is the, just the number of connections you have, and eigenvector centrality, which is the number of connections you have with people or groups that are highly connected. So it's important to be highly connected, to have lots of friends. But it's even more important to be connected to friends that are also well connected, right? So this first measure, just look at uh, the neighbors of a 
an independent actor. This, the second one looks at the entire structure. But in both cases, we find that AQAM is very central. It tends to be in conflict with the largest number of people, of, of groups, but also in conflict with groups that are themselves in conflict with many others. We also find, you know, those are the usual suspects, if you, if you want, Boko Haram in Nigeria, but also a number of Islamic groups um, working across the region, and also the enemies of those groups. So in pure network terms, being strongly connected is not seen as something positive, it's a liability. Because highly connected actors, um, meaning actors fighting many others, can have high constraints on their military operations. It can also reduce the ability of highly connected groups to coordinate across the region. So radical groups who have few enemies would be more able to um, operate and achieve political goals. Yes? Um, I, can, I, I just had a quick question yes. was from the slide before. Of course. Um, so Fighting these groups in the Sahara Sahel region, it would be, for instance, a combination of the military and the police. They would be working together to fight these groups. Is that, or is it more a military role against these groups? If you don't mind my asking. I, I just noticed it because you had military forces and police forces. Uh, yes, most of the government forces are trying to to fight against those groups. Is okay, it your so question? Or? Yeah, it would be a cop. So is it both the military? If you take, for instance, Algeria, would it be the military working with the police against these <coughs> actors? Do you see where I'm going? Is it a combination of a military approach and a police approach? It or is it mainly left to the military to fight these actors? No, it's a combination of the two. But because we only look at negative terms, we only look at conflicts, we don't know to what extent does the military and we could, because we have data, we don't use that for this paper. Mm -hmm. yes, I, I do know that in the case of Nigeria, in Boko Haram, yeah. they're taking a mostly military approach because the police has, has no credibility in this respect. They are seen as the cause for them uprising and be becoming even more destructive uh -huh. because the police killed their leader. Yes. And also in, in Nigeria, the police is relegated really to the background because of the military um, dictatorships of before sort of demobilized the police. So they're mostly powerless when you come to this kind of um, fighting insurgency and, and serious violence. Mm -hmm. uh, something interesting in this region is that this group of Guaran has been quite successful despite having very few friends, which is exactly the same situation as the Islamic State in the Middle East, which is fighting pretty much everybody, but still, which is gaining power in the region. So now I'm going to uh, discuss the second part of the paper, which is about space and how those groups actually travel across the region. We can only focus on a number of groups because uh, we need to track the location of the events and then uh, it becomes very complicated when you have lots of groups. So we only look at nine groups which are all in some way related. I'm going to explain why. We look at um, more than 1,500 events, a large number of victims, and we focus on this period of time, 2004, the last 10 years, uh, because this is when most cross-border movements took place. Instead of looking at each of those groups, yes? Can, can you be a little more uh, descriptive of how you categorize what events you looked at? Like, were you selective or not? Yeah. 
so far we haven't selected the events. We have taken everything that was violent and we have selected the groups. But because we have detailed information about what happened, we could be more selective and just look at a particular time of the event. It's not been done so far. <laughs> We aggregate all the data and consider that we have just one single social network. Despite the fact that we have different groups, people tend to move from one group to another. So it would be very artificial to define those groups into nine different sub-networks. And this is one of the justifications of aggregating all the data. You can see the, it's a simplified evolution of uh, Al-Qaeda affiliated groups over, uh, since 1992, from which you can see that there is a connection in some way because those groups are often working together or they, are, um, they split from each other, but sometimes they merge, and it would be very difficult to know exactly what would boundaries of the group be at a certain point of time. So we merge all the data even though we have different kind of groups with different types of uh, ideology, if you wish. And we test two different scenarios. The first one is that it's a mobility scenario in which groups tend to move freely across the region. This is the first image you can see here. So they do not come back to a particular region, which is the case for the second scenario where you have a sanctuary which is used by radical groups as a, 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 as a region from which they can operate in different neighboring countries. So we test which uh, situation we have. And when we map the movements, this is what we get. So from 2004 to 2011, you can see the chronological evolution of the violent events related to radical groups in the Sahara. I don't know if you can distinguish the colors, but the main point is that between 2004 and 2011, those groups are free to operate with very few constraints on their <coughs> And they are also able to travel thousands of miles across uh, some of the most difficult environments in the world. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very surprising result that we don't have any evidence of a sanctuary um, scenario in this region for this period of time. Now, of course, we have regions where um, a large number of events took place by Timbuktu in, in Mali or this region here it's a mountainous region between uh, Algeria, Niger and Mali and this is where most of the rebellions started in Mali in 2012 um, radical groups and secessionists Control of the northern part of Mali, this is the Mali uh, civil war, during which those groups were extremely successful and they succeeded in um, uh, well, uh, occupying this large region, which is about the size of Texas in the US. So it's, it's quite a big piece of West Africa. It took place in uh, 2012, and if we look at the evolution of the movements now, we can see a very different picture from the one from 2004 and 2011. Now we have a concentration of movements between Bamako, which is the capital city of Mali, to uh, the southern part of Algeria. Uh, and we can highlight a major change in the spatial patterns of which now seem to operate along a very narrow corridor uh, which connects uh, mainly Bali and Algeria. Um, I want to have some time for, for discussion, so I'm just going to conclude by 
summarizing a few points, if you look at the social structure of those groups in the region, you find a very typical negative tie network where you have a low density and where most of the time enemies of enemies are friends, like you would expect. AQAM is the most connected actor which can be seen in network terms as a liability. And most of the conflicts take place between actors with adverse attributes, like radical groups and governments, radical groups and civilians. But if you look at the speciality of, of radical groups, you find a high level of transnational activity, which, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, make it very difficult for policymakers to uh, design Security strategies. Of course, there is a very significant change since 2000, uh, 2004 because before that, uh, very few groups were actually crossing borders. We don't find any evidence of a sanctuary uh, area which would be used to conduct operations in other countries. Uh, so, a few policy implications. What does it mean for those who are um, designing a stra uh, strategic, um, well, security strategies in the region? Well, first it means that if you have groups that are socially and specially mobile, you need a regional institution. Where you cannot have a collection of different national strategies. This is not going to work. You also need to coordinate the Sahel strategies that have been developed by different international organizations, such as the UN, but also different African supranational bodies that have designed their own Sahel strategies, and now the goal is to try to integrate all those strategies. For the military, the main objective is to design mobile and flexible responses, because you know that these groups are very likely to move across the region. And this is exactly what the French did when they intervened in Mali in 2013. It also means that you have to combine security and development. Of course, you have to um, have much more control on what is crossing borders and also try to we establish state authority in the region in order to promote peace and development. I'm just going to conclude by listing a couple of papers for those of you who are interested. And again, please email me if you want a copy of the book. I'd be happy to uh, send a link to you. Thanks very much. interesting that you know the state has two enemies that these two enemies will coordinate together to try to defeat the state. Uh, why is it the 
to build, but I mean, it seems from the perspective of the state, it would be smart to make a friend out of one of those enemies to try to sort of eradicate the other enemy. Does that occur, or, or are there different? I mean, it seems like there must also be another layer, of some sort of um, ideological compatibility or something between the, the warring groups that prevents the state from disrupting that, or, hmm. or not. I mean, I don't know. I was just wondering. Well, that's a good point, actually. Um, in many, the state tried to play that game to play one group against the other, and it, it worked for a couple of years in the northern part of the country. But then those groups um, changed, and the uh, um, government was not able to take control of the situation anymore. So it can work up to a certain point, I would say. And your second question was about. Uh, it was, well, are there other causes, yes. I mean, what are, is it sort of, is there also an ideological yeah, match right. rather than just a common enemy? You know, one of the limitations of working with social networks like this is that you don't actually understand the content of the ties. You just know that two groups are in conflict with, with mm -hmm. each other. What we need now is more qualitative information about the formation and the development of ties over mm -hmm. time. But if I like to start with mapping um, connections and then trying to explain Why? what I see. Yeah. In the second step, you need more um, information about what, what, what you're interested in. Uh, how, how are these groups communicating with each other? Are they going? Are they communicating online? Are they? Establishing a link, how are you finding them? Oh, uh, they used to communicate through satellite um, devices, yeah. but it's quite easy to track now. So um, they communicate through people, and it's much more uh, efficient. Mm -hmm. And they also communicate through uh, letters. Some of the letters have been found in Timbuktu, for example. Um, they communicate in different ways, but the major point is that when you have to communicate across groups, you need to trust people. So most of the connections between those groups rely on previous uh, alliances, uh, kinship, or ethnic affiliation. That's something that is very uh, resilient, very, very strong. Yes? Yeah. Um, I have two questions. The first one, have you established a link be between uh, uh, refugee camps in those regions and the rise of uh, militias? Is that any specific link? Because I guess that if you have cross borders refugee camps that can facilitate of, uh, yeah. the rise of militias. I don't know if in your study you have studied that. Like. We haven't looked into that, but I know that some of the refugee camps at the border between Algeria and Morocco have long been, uh, well, many people believe that they also serve for uh, radical groups to hire uh, people. But we haven't This paper is perhaps the first that we should write on the topic. Uh, social network analysis had, had never been applied in that way in this region. And we wanted to show that uh, there was a great potential and that the existing data should also be used in that way. Because um, the, people, the people behind uh, the data set have published a lot, but they have always done this, they have blockaded the line of events, or they have looked at the historical evolution. We wanted to show that it's possible to go well beyond that. I think you have a question, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting to look like from state-centric perspective on transnational actors because like 
if you look, for example, at ISIS, yes, mm -hmm. it's like, what is the rationale for a transnational actor to strive for being state-centric yes. and to, uh, to strive for being that hub that attract other like Akim for, for for instance in Africa. Like how do you then apply this network analysis in terms of as you said allegiances, yes? yes. So uh, is it is it applicable this analysis of that different levels? Because in the international studies this is taboo. You either look at international level yeah. or domestic level. You never bridge different okay. levels of analysis, yes, you don't look at the and here is what you do because you kind of like you you, you bridge different level of yes. analysis in order to, to achieve your your goal because because you look at regional level you look at international level and actually you, you just like mix it up and to yeah. to 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 achieve the result which is interesting. Yeah, I guess that's one of the major advantages of uh, social analysis. You don't actually care about the level of analysis, yeah. whether it's national. Or you just have to select the kind of actor you want to consider as a node, and then you find the boundaries of the network. Uh -huh. um, perhaps I can tell a few words about that. But as, at some point, we are all connected. I'm sure I can find a connection between you and I. I mean, through DGA. I'm sure there's, there's a link between us. And when you collect data about networks, you don't know where to start. At some point, you have to say, this belongs to the network, and this doesn't. And that's the trickiest part. So one way to select, uh, to, to draw the boundaries is to select a number of, uh, or type of actor, and you have a limited number of actors. If you start with everybody, then you have to find Area to draw boundaries, and that can be discussed. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, coming back on the level of fatality. Yes. Does it happen often during the offensive uh, mode or defensive? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you know we have thousands of events, mm -hmm. so. There's, there's a way to know if you have what kind of event it is. And you use that column to know what kind of what's the time of the event that you select. In this study we have selected all the violent events, whatever the type was, but you have different types of violent activities. You can focus on uh, riots, for example, you can focus on uh, battles. characterize uh, the connection between organized crime, if I mean, if I mean organized crime and terrorist organization in this region. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably one of the most topical issues now. Last year, I was contacted by the OECD to, because they wanted to know about that, and hardly any, anybody knows, actually. So, uh, uh, now there's, there's survey done on this issue, which is probably one of the most complicated you can imagine. But we know that there's a link between um, traffickers and terrorists, because in many occasions uh, they work together or they were the same people. It's, um, there's a very famous uh, trafficker named uh, Mokhtar Ben Mokhtar is also a prominent uh, terrorist. So that can be explained by the fact that the way these people use this huge region is the same if you want to travel for a religious or political, um, uh, if you have political or religious objectives, or if you have purely an economic objectives. You can do it the same way, you use the same networks. So no distinction. I'm sorry? No distinctions between these people. 
I don't think anybody knows exactly what, what the distinction is. <laughs> I wish I, I, I knew about that. <laughs> it's definitely a great topic for further research. Yes? Uh, I had a question about this particular database. The sources, was it all new sources? Or I'm not sure what some of these things are. Were there uh, individual reporters or was it through media? Or? Um, in, it's mostly uh, newspapers published in French, English, and Arabic. So um, I, I didn't have, a, I, you cannot see it, but. Uh, you have a few notes here, and you have a web link where you can actually find the original uh, source of the information if you want to have more. But that was enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure that if you have a very narrow focus on one region or one particular group, it would be very interesting to read the notes and to uh, be able to select more precisely the events could not be done here. Yes? Yes. Um, you looked at Africa, but did you look at anywhere else? Were there any trends you saw, like Southeast Asia? Or? Uh, no, because the data set is limited to Africa. Okay. But was there anything in common? Because I know there's conflict too of terrorism that arises in Africa. Uh, yes, we were very much limited by the kind of data we had for this this paper. I know some of the people who work at the I would say the international level between macro regions, but that's a different type of uh, analysis. We didn't go into that. Okay, sorry, because then I think what I was trying to ask you was whether you saw any similarities across the world with uh, terrorists. We haven't compared this. to formulate it, it's like, it, it makes like perfect sense uh, to conclude that regional uh, approach is the most viable and uh, I think the Mali proved it at the subsequent like e EU missions that were, that now operate there, they also trans-regional, I think they are in Niger, Mali, and, uh, Nigeria, but like for example if you look at uh, how they try to counter Boko Haram, mm -hmm. uh, the African mission, it's mostly like a military approach only, so it is regional, and it tries to counter a threat, mm -hmm. but it's very limited, so it's only in a, in a, in a military way. So will you, how you will evaluate the effectiveness of the regional approach? So what components would you include? Should it be only military? Should it include some humanitarian aspects? So how to then counter um, those networks in order to uh, to cut the knot. Yeah. Well, that's tricky because there's a very simple narrative which says that uh, poverty leads to terrorism. Yeah. Which is simply not true in this region. The north of Mali is probably one of the richest. That's difficult to say because Mali is a very poor country. But the people behind terrorist activities in the Sahara are not poor and they are also not they are also well educated and they have a long experience of conflict in Afghanistan and other parts of the world. So it would, it would be too easy if we could just fix terrorism by um, eradicating uh, poverty. But it doesn't mean that only military responses are should be adopted. In the case of Nigeria it was very clear that something had to be done in military terms but it, I guess it's better if it's only a first step and then we have uh, development uh, actions are taken. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, Chica, if you have well, something to say I think the recent election has, has also because a lot of the reason the incumbent was booted out was because mm -hmm. of Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a political aspect also to Boko Haram activity and I don't know they might be negotiating behind the scenes 
and doing something different because we haven't heard anything from Boko Haram since the elections. Yes. Let's stay tuned. <laughs> Everyone started thinking. <laughs> what will happen? I mean, that, yes? But in the case of Nigeria, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're still in the conflict. Because I looked at some of your data, and I wanted to ask whether you were trying to, were, were you, were the fatalities or those, the conflicts were, were you also talking about religious conflict, Christian? Yeah. And yes, we are. Okay. Of course, yes. It's a major part of uh, the data we use. I don't mean to imply that the, the conflict is, there's always conflict. I'm just saying it's cooled down and there's a space for some negotiation. Do you have another question? Yeah, I, I was wondering, are you looking at composition of radical groups? Um, in terms of ethnicity, foreign component, are you doing any work along those lines? Who's actually compiling the radical group? Not really. What we've done is to try to uh, explain um, the evolution of all the groups that were affiliated with Al Qaeda in the region. Mm -hmm. But we could, of, of course, look at what is going on within each of the groups. Some In terms of social structure, we wanted to highlight the main and the key players. Okay. And we wanted also to see what kind of constraints they had. Because uh, the autonomy of actors is limited by the social structure, how they are embedded 